In this video, we're going to take a look at one last method of proof, which is a proof by cases or proof by exhaustion. When we do a proof by cases, essentially what we're trying to think through is all of the different ways in which a situation could happen. For instance, I'm going to prove if n is an integer, then n is less than or equal to n squared. So here's an implication, if p, then q. Now, hopefully at this point in your mathematics study, you have determined that negative values sometimes react differently in a function than positive values. And zero often acts differently than anything else. So that is what I chose to use for my cases. I'm going to take a look at what happens when I have a negative value which I'm saying n is less than or equal to negative 1. So let's think about a number line here for a minute. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And notice that I'm using just integers. So if I say n is less than or equal to negative 1, that gives me negative 1 and any integer to the left of that on my number line. Case 2 says n is equal to 0, again because 0 often reacts differently than other things. That takes care of zero, and n is greater than or equal to one, starts at one, and gives me anything to the right of that. And so you might be thinking, well, that's great, but look, you've got some spaces here, so you're being sloppy. Now, if this were any real number, not any integer, then those spaces would be a real problem. But because I'm dealing with integers only, then this is an exhaustive proof because I'm using all of the integers less than or equal to negative 1. The next integer is 0, which I've covered. The next integer is 1, and then I have everything greater than 1. And so this is exhaustive, meaning that I have covered everything. Now, if you get uncomfortable with those spaces, instead just say n is less than 0 and n is greater than 0, and you're going to get the same result. Now that we know our three cases, let's go about making this proof happen. Case one says n is less than or equal to negative one. Keep in mind, what I'm looking for each time is to show that this relationship is true, that n is less than or equal to n squared. So what happens if I have a negative value? If I have a negative value and I square it, n squared is always going to be positive. It's always going to be positive because a negative times a negative is a positive. So therefore, it follows. So therefore, it follows n is less than or equal to n squared because n squared is positive and n is clearly negative. Now, notice I didn't write all of those words. I would write all of those words if I were doing this proof for an assignment or a test. Case 2 says n equals 0, and whenever you have an equal, you just do direct substitution. 0 is less than or equal to 0 squared, and 0 squared is, of course, 0. 0 is, in fact, less than or equal to 0, therefore it follows that n is less than or equal to n squared for case 2. For case 3, n is greater than or equal to 1, so if n is greater than or equal to 1, and I multiply the left side by n, and I multiply the right side by n, I end up with n squared is greater than or equal to n. So it follows that n is less than or equal to n squared. So how would I wrap this up? Since n is less than or equal to n squared for all cases, or for all values in our domain, we can conclude if n is an integer, then n is less than or equal to n squared. Let's take a look at another proof. This is a proof of an implication. If P, 
then Q. And again, even though there's no then, that's okay. And what I'm looking at now is how do I prove this? Well, in our last proof by cases, we were concerned about the sign of the value, whether I'm plugging in a positive, a negative, or a zero. Here, instead, I'm worried about the parity, whether something is even or odd. So I'm going to have three cases here. I'm going to say case one is n is even. Case two, n is zero. And again, I'm using zero because zero is not considered even or odd. And then case three is n is odd. Because based on what I'm trying to prove that something is even, I know that what I plug into it may have some effect on the outcome. So if I start with case one, I'm saying n is even. So therefore, n is equal to 2k for some k that is an integer. So then I'm going to take n squared plus 3n plus 2 and just continue to do the math here. So if I square this, I get 4k squared plus 6k plus 2 and then if I take a 2 out of everything, I get 2k squared plus 3k plus 1. And remember the way that we did this before is quite often we'd say, well, that's equal to 2r, where r is equal to all of that stuff. 2k squared plus 3k plus 1. So why does that matter? Because what I've just shown is that for case 1, if n is an integer, then 2n, or sorry, n squared plus 3n plus 2 is even. So 1 out of 3. Case 2, again, this is just an equal, so I'm just going to plug it in. 0 squared plus 3 times 0 plus 2, which is equal to 0 plus 0 plus 2, which is equal to 2, and 2, last I checked, even. Case 3, n is odd. So if n is odd, then I'm going to say n is equal to 2m plus 1 for some m that is an integer. And I'm going to do the same thing I did before for case 1. And I'm going to say n squared, so n is now 2m plus 1 squared, plus 3 times 2m plus 1 plus 2. Remember that I'm foiling this, I'm not just squaring each of the terms. So that gives me 4m squared plus 4m plus 1. And then I'm distributing the 3, so that's 6m plus 3, and then I still have the plus 2. And then I'm simplifying to get 4m squared plus 10m plus 6. And then I can take a 2 out of everything to get 2m squared plus 5m plus 3. And again, I can say all of this stuff is equal to, say, L, where L is equal to everything I had in there, 2m squared plus 5m plus 3, which is even. And again, then I just summarize. Therefore, n squared plus 3n plus 2 is even if n is an integer. Or, of course, I could say if n is an integer, then n squared plus 3n plus 2 is even. You get the idea? It's the same thing. I'm going to go through just one more proof with you, but this one's kind of a doozy, so I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on it. The reason this one's a little bit different is it still is an implication, which we're used to, but if you'll notice, I have quite a bit going on here in the first part of my implication, and then my second part just says both x and y are even. So I want to talk to you about how this would look using propositional logic. If I let P represent x times y is even, 
And if I let Q represent X plus Y is even, and then I let R represent both X and Y are even. This is the way I'm choosing to do it. Now, as we know, there's lots of different ways to represent things using propositional logic correctly. This is the way that I'm going to do it. So based on the way that I have assigned my propositions, I can rewrite this statement as if P and Q, then R. If X times Y is even and X plus Y is even, then both X and Y are even. And again, I totally skipped this R integers part, but again, I would just say for the domain of integers. Now, the reason that I wrote this using propositional logic is because though I'm going to use a proof by cases, I'm going to also use a proof by contraposition. So if you'll recall, a proof by contraposition says, if I'm showing if P then Q, a proof by contraposition would assume not Q, and you would then prove not P. The reason I bring this up is because if I do that here, then I'm saying if not R, then not P and Q. And hopefully you recall De Morgan's law, that says not P and Q would be not P or not Q. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume not R and then show that either not P or not Q is true. Now, one more thing that's gonna make this a little bit more complicated because obviously this is a proof by cases. Let's think about what my cases are. So I could have that X is odd and Y is odd, or X is odd and Y is even, or X is even and Y is odd, or X is even and Y is even. So you might say, okay, cool, we've got four cases, let's get started. But that's not quite the case. I am assuming not R. R says both X and Y are even, so I'm assuming that's not the case. I'm gonna change colors there. I'm going to assume case four is not a possibility. So that leaves me three cases. Now, I could go ahead and do these three cases, and that's just fine, but I want to introduce to you a concept of that's called without loss of generality, because you're going to see this um, throughout your studies, and I don't have a whole video on without loss of generality. So essentially what this means is if you would take a closer look at case two and case three, and I'm looking at what's going to happen with P and Q. Case two says X is odd. So let's just make up an odd number. And let's say I'm multiplying that by an even, because again, I'm looking at case two. So if I multiplied these two, I would get an even number, and if I added these two, I would get an odd number. Now let's take a look at case three. X is even, Y is odd. So let's say I take two times three, and I get an even, and again, two plus three, and I get an odd. So what I'm telling you is based on what case two and case three are, and based on the propositions that they are affecting, case two and case three are exactly the same. So when we use something called without loss of generality, we're saying, I'm going to assume something is true and it's not going to affect the outcome because there's, for instance, more than one case that has the same outcome. So without loss of generality, I will assume I'm not going to use that arrow because then you'll think it's an implication. Without loss of generality, I will assume that X is odd. Again, why? Because I'm just going to show case one and case two, and I'm not going to show case three because case three is going to give me whatever happens with case two. 
So now that we've done all of the setup, let's actually do this proof. So I've made the assumption without loss of generality that x is odd. Therefore, x could be written as 2m plus 1 for some m that is an integer. My two cases are that y is odd or that y is even. Now, if you'll recall what I'm trying to show, so before I actually get started on it, I'm trying to show either not this or not this, again, by de Morgan's law, which we went through just a few moments ago. So let's see what happens. Case one, I'm going to find x times y, and I'm going to find x plus y, and I'm going to see what happens. And remember, these are we're saying these are even, so if I'm saying not that, I'm really just looking for one of those to be odd. So I'm looking for one of these guys to be odd. So x times y would be 2m plus 1 times, we're letting y be 2n plus 1 because it's also odd. And if I FOIL, I get 4mn plus 2m plus 2n plus 1. If I take a 2 out of the first three terms, I get 2mn plus m plus n plus 1. And again, I could just rewrite that as 2r plus 1, where r represents 2mn plus m plus n. And therefore, this is odd because it is written in the format of an odd number. I'm going to move over this x plus y because obviously I'm going to run out of room if I don't. So x plus y, and I could stop right there for case one because I've already shown that one of them is odd, but let's go ahead and just see what happens. 2m plus 1 plus 2n plus 1 gives me 2m plus 2n plus 2, which gives me 2 times m plus n plus 1. 2 times something, this is an even. But again, I'm not concerned by that because I just need one or the other to be odd. So, so far so good. Case two, again, I'm still looking at x times y and x plus y, but now y is even, so y is represented by 2n. So x times y would be 2m plus 1 times 2n which gives me 4mn plus 2n. This clearly is going to give me an even value. But again, I'm not concerned unless this guy is also even. So now let's try this guy and see what happens. x plus y would be 2m plus 1 plus 2n. I could rewrite that as 2 times the quantity of m plus n plus 1. And again, I could rewrite that in another way, but this is clearly an odd number. And I don't have a ton of room for the conclusion, so I'm just going to say the conclusion aloud that if x and y are integers and both x times y and x plus y are even, then both x and y are even. And again, this was a proof by contradiction and contraposition. Now that we have learned quite a few different methods of proof, we are going to take a look at some types of proof, which are proofs of existence and uniqueness.